So thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Northville District Library. Thank you, hostesses. Uh, it's an honor to be talking about this event. It's not a very pleasant one, but it's an important one. Every year in April, in fact, April 24th, an anniversary rolls around in which Armenians all over the world mark as the anniversary the begin of the beginning of the Armenian genocide. That event has not gone in the last century and six years without controversy. Indeed, officially, the Turkish government, which is the heir of the Ottoman Empire, which carried out the genocide, systematically denies that the massacres, deportations, and forced assimilation into Islam of hundreds of thousands of Armenians, events in which as many as a million Armenians may have lost their lives and certainly were dispossessed from their historic homeland. All of those events are denied officially by the government in Ankara and in the school curriculum in Turkey today. This position of denial, or what we call denialism, is the official position of the government of Erdogan. And it basically argues something like this. There was no genocide in 1915, and the Armenians are to blame for it anyway. Armenians were a rebellious, seditious, group of people who presented an existential danger to the Ottoman Empire. In fact, the Muslims and Christians had lived for centuries, this view argues, in the empire, peacefully and in harmony, until a bunch of seditious and aggressive Armenians were influenced by outside agitators, usually from the Russian Empire, but sometimes American missionaries, and began to preach to the Armenians that they ought to be independent, have their own country, and take part of the lands of the empire. Now, almost nothing in that narrative is true, but it has been propagated for a very long time. And indeed, in Turkey, people have been persecuted or sent to jail for arguing precisely the opposite view. Now, on the other side, and what I'm going to try to do tonight is explain why this genocide took place. First, I'm going to tell you what the events were and then try to give you an explanation. I'm going to counter this denialist uh, 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 interpretation, but I'm not necessarily going to subscribe to some of those who hold the opposite view. When people beside the official Turkish government try to explain the genocide, they often do it in a variety of ways, which I find suspicious. Sometimes they argue this was a classic example of a Christian Muslim conflict, that it was a kind of religious struggle. I think that is absolutely wrong. Religion plays a role. Armenians were Christians. Turks and Kurds were Muslim, and certainly religion distinguished the communities. But at the same time, uh, Armenians lived within the Ottoman Empire. They lived there for 500 years, and many of them saw their lives, their fortunes, and their destinies in this multinational conglomerate we call an empire. So religion is there but it's not the primary cause of the mass killings that took place in 1915. Some people argue instead that it was nationalism. Well, if you don't know the answer to something, you can always blame nationalism because people believe uh, that term explains everything. And nationalism is one of these great big terms that seems to argue that anything from the way you love music, the kinds of foods you eat, to aggressive 
assimilation of a subordinate population. All of these things are nationalism. So nationalism is too broad a concept to be a very effective uh, explanation. Though the Uh, Ronald, it looks like you're somehow you accidentally muted yourself. Can you unmute uh, that? Uh, Thank you. Can we stop those bells from ringing? It would be very nice if you could do that. Okay, so there are a couple of different explanations. You know, it didn't happen. It was largely religion. It was nationalist conflict between Armenians and and uh, the Muslims of the empire. There are a variety of different ways you can explain it. Now, some people don't even bother to explain it. Many Armenians don't think you have to explain it. After all, the perpetrators of the genocide were Turks. And that's an adequate explanation. But of course, for any of us, that should be unacceptable. That is, it's a kind of racist argument. Why would a group of people, Muslim, Turk, whatever, in fact, carry out such events? So let's try now to figure out what story we can tell to try to understand what happened and why it happened 106 years ago. Here's a map of the Ottoman Empire. Well, at the, its greatest extent, you can see an empire with its capital at, at Istanbul that extended into the Balkans here, all the way up to Vienna, through the Arab Middle East, all the way in North Africa. Uh, it was a huge and major power in its time. But over centuries, that empire shrank as it was attacked by European powers. Until by the time we tell our story by World War I, which began in 1914, the empire was largely being driven out of Europe, out of the Balkans, into this large peninsula, which makes up present day Turkey, that is the peninsula of Anatolia. Now, Armenians were largely uh, living in the far eastern part of this Anatolian peninsula. They also lived across the border in the Russian Empire and in the Persian Empire. Most of the Armenians in eastern Turkey were peasants or craftsmen, middle-class people, artisans, and the wealthiest Armenians lived in Istanbul, a very cosmopolitan uh, group of Armenians. Here is the Ottoman Empire roughly at the time of the Armenian genocide. You could see that eventually the heir to this empire would be the present day Turkish Republic, now with its capital at Ankara. Turkey today is what we call a nation. A nation is a group of people like Armenians or Americans who imagines itself to be a political community distinct from the rest of mankind that share a culture. And because they share a culture, maybe they're all Armenians or maybe they're all French, they ought to rule themselves. And they ought to control a territory, namely the homeland. Most states in the world today, we can call nation states. They represent a nation. But that's very different from what empires were. Empires like the Ottoman Empire were not made up of a single people that identified with the ruling institutions and believed they could have self-government. Empires were mixed, composite states made up of various kinds of people. And most importantly, they were the people who ruled were considered superior to those they ruled. There was inequity, uh, inequality between ruler and ruled. In nation states, we're all supposed to be at least equal under the law. And the Ottoman Empire fit that bill very much. There were wealthy people and poor people. Here are actually two kinds of Armenians. One is almost uh, Pasha-like in his uh, elegant dress, while the other, a Hamal, a porter, was quite poor. Armenians had their own civilization in the Ottoman Empire. Many of them aspired to be middle class or bourgeois and affected the habits and the dress of Europeans. 
Indeed, Armenians, like Greeks and Jews in the empire, were among the most educated people in the Ottoman lands. And that indeed created a kind of resentment among others of the lower classes or the provinces, many of whom were Muslim, who saw the Armenians, these Christians, as kind of an uppity uh, group of people who seemed to lord it over the less fortunate Muslims. Armenians occasionally dressed in their native costumes, which they had largely abandoned, and learned to propagate their own culture within the empire. But again, mainly they were aspiring, and though the upper classes among Armenians were wealthy merchants, the Ottoman Sultan's uh, head of the mint was an Ottoman, many of his officials were, were Armenian uh, as well. And so this group of Armenians, increasingly visible within the empire, created among many people, both in government and among the lower classes, a kind of social resentment. Why were they doing better than us? After all, this is a Muslim empire. The Sultan is head, the Caliph of, of Islam. Why is it that these Christians, tied as they are to Europe, are so fortunate? Are they really ours or are they a foreign element? Armenians in the Ottoman Empire were heavily influenced by their church, the Christian church. They claimed to be the first country in the world that adopted Christianity. And so among the ruling elites among Armenians were the clergy. They were the more conservative people, but they were extraordinarily effective and Armenians identified with that church. One of the things I would argue in my work is that Armenians could be in the Ottoman Empire, both Armenian, loyal to their church and their ethnic group and their culture, and also Ottoman. They lived in this country, of course. Armenians in America can be Armenian and also American. And after all, they had lived in this empire for centuries, always as subordinate peoples who tried their best to improve their situation, but still able in many ways to make a living and even to succeed in life. I would argue that that upward mobility of many Armenians, in fact, began to change in the reign of this man, Abdul Hamid II, or the bloody Sultan. Abdul Hamid, who came to power in the second half of the 1870s, would rule the empire until he was overthrown in 1909. He himself believed that Armenians were a subversive element that threatened the existence of the empire and decided to make a kind of pact, an agreement with the Kurdish tribes of Eastern Anatolia who were a dominant and armed force in those areas inhabited by Armenians. And the, he formed a regiment named after himself, the Hamidia, which would patrol the area, guard the frontiers, and keep the Armenians in their place. Armenians responded to these predations of the Kurds and the more negative policies of Abdul Hamid II and formed their own revolutionary groups, often from Russian Armenians across the borders. And here is a group of these fierce warriors who were ready to defend the Armenians and only served, in fact, to antagonize and create fear in the, in the eyes uh, and minds of the regime. One of the leaders, a Armenian from the Ottoman Empire, was Antranik. And again, they posed in these pictures uh, with their bandoleros of, of, button, uh, of bullets uh, in order to create a sense that Armenians are here to defend themselves. Uh, and of course, this had both positive and negative effects. Many Armenians did not trust these revolutionaries. Others uh, hid them, supported them, fed them, and encouraged them. Well, in the 1890s, 1894, five, six, Massacres broke out. Uh, local Muslims were fearful of the Armenian presence 
Abdul Hamid encouraged, or at least looked the other way. And this became a huge sc scandalous event when tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Armenians were massacred in what we call the Hamidian massacres. And this is what gave the name to the Sultan of the bloody, of the bloody Sultan of Red uh, Abdul Hamid. Now, uh, in the, among Turks as well, there were groups of people like these fellows you're seeing. These were called Young Turks, who were also revolutionaries and wanted to overthrow the Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Indeed, at, at times, Turkish revolutionaries allied themselves with Armenian revolutionaries, both interested in creating a more constitutional, somewhat limited monarchy. And indeed, eventually, in 1908, a young Turk revolution <clears throat> was carried out, and Armenians and Greeks and Jews and Turks and every, uh, almost everyone in the empire celebrated this new event. Because it was a hopeful moment in 1908, the young Turks who were themselves professionals, some military men, were going to restore the constitution which had been abrogated by Abdul Hamid, and they were going to give civil rights, open up the parliament, give greater equality, recognize the, uh, the uh, various cultures in the empire. This was a hopeful moment. But within a year, massacres reoccurred in a town on the Mediterranean called Adana, where fearful Muslims who saw the Armenians raising their heads, marching with guns, ringing their church bells, revolted and carried out massacres in which in the various towns of that area, about 20,000 Armenians died. My own grandfather, who was born in Turkey, an Armenian, uh, himself left Turkey after these massacres, believing there was no future. His whole family, which remained in Turkey, would die in the genocide. He lived to be 100 years old as a tailor in Philadelphia. Eventually, among the young Turks who came to power, and here are some of the leaders, Enver Pasha and Jamal Pasha, uh, among these young Turks, a view began to develop that they needed to make Turkey more Muslim, more Turkish. They were increasingly influenced by what you could call a Turkic nationalism. And this, of course, worried, in fact, uh, frightened the non-Muslim peoples, the Jews, the Greeks, and particularly the Armenians who were being increasingly targeted. If there's any man who can be called the architect of the genocide, it is Talat Pasha. By the way, the word Pasha is simply an official term, usually meant to mean general, high official. And so Enver Pasha, Jemal Pasha, and Talat Pasha are not generals or not brothers. They are simply people in the government who have reached this rank. Those three men, Jemal, Enver, and Talat, seized power in a bloody coup d'etat in January 1913. And from that date, the most radical of the young Turks was now in power. And the very next year, World War I broke out and the young Turks decided to join with the Germans against the Entente. So the Ottoman Empire was allied with the German Empire with the Austro-Hungarian Empire against Britain, France, and Russia. And the war broke out. Now here we see a map of the Ottoman Empire and the Ottomans were forced to fight on nine different fronts against the British in Egypt uh, and in Basra, against the Russians up here uh, on the, uh, in the Caucasian front here. Uh, the British came and the French came in the Dardanelles. There was fighting in, in, uh, in Gallipoli as well. So the empire was put upon. But in that moment, 
of the early war, the Russians won a great battle against the Ottoman army, defeating the army of Enver Pasha at a place called Sarikamush. And Enver even thought, maybe I'm going to be cashiered now or blamed for this great defeat. But by the time he returned to Istanbul, another story had developed that Armenians had betrayed the, the Ottomans, that they had sided with the Russians. And therefore they were traitors, openly in rebellion, and they had to be crushed. Our anti-Armenian feeling had been developing for a long time, but now a kind of conspiracy theory, a myth developed of the Armenians as subversive revolutionaries about to overthrow to revolt and overthrow the empire. There was no such conspiracy. Indeed, tens of thousands of young Armenian boys had been recruited and were serving in the Ottoman army against the Russians. Some Russian Armenians were serving with the Russians uh, against the Ottomans because the Armenians were caught on both sides of the frontier. You see, Russian Armenians were up here in the, those areas and Ottoman Armenians over here. This is the beginning of the genocide then. Almost immediately, the Armenian soldiers were demobilized, their uniforms taken away, their weapons uh, taken away. They were then forced into labor battalions and eventually they were murdered. In the first stage of the genocide, you could say, the Ottomans destroyed the muscle of the Armenians by destroying the youth. The second phase of the genocide after Sarika Mishin, here's a graphic picture of the Russian defeat and the Ottoman losses, was to arrest on April 24th, 1915, this is why we mark this day, the leading intellectuals and politicians in Istanbul, members of parliament, great writers, the composer Gomitas, uh, and many others. Most of them were taken out of the city and eventually murdered. Now the Ottomans had destroyed the muscle of the Armenians, and now they decapitated the nation, getting rid of its leaders. There was no possibility effectively for massive Armenian resistance to what followed. In some places, the Armenians did manage to resist. In the city of Van, one of the few cities where Armenians were a plurality or maybe a small minority. They dug trenches in their part of the city. They held out in, in Van, uh, which is today a Kurdish city largely, uh, and they held the city until the Russian army came down and liberated them briefly. Here's a map of the various deportations from the major cities all over the Ottoman Empire. People were rounded up. They'd gotten rid of young people. They've gotten rid of the leaders. Now they took the women, the children, the old people, and forced marched them through the mountains and valleys of Anatolia into the deserts of Syria. They would be placed here uh, in Derzor, in Raqqa, in many of the places that a few years ago the uh, ISIS was located and the Americans were working with the Kurds to destroy uh, that movement. And so you see these massive deportation caravans. Many people died on the caravans. And when they reached the deserts, they largely starved to death. And then in 1916, there was a second round of massacres in those deserts. The genocide and the loss of these hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million or more people, in fact, had three prongs to it. One was outright murder, mass murder, usually of men. The second was deportation and starvation, people dying along the routes and at the end of the trail in Der al -Zor. And the third was forced assimilation, 
Many Armenians, mostly women and children, because the men suffered the most, mostly women and children were forced to convert to Islam and became either orphans, wives, or even servants and slaves of Muslim uh, families. So in other words, many Armenian women and children survived the genocide, now becoming Muslims. And at the current moment, many of them are rediscovering their Armenian roots. The pictures I'm about to show you are some of the few we have of the victims of the genocide. They were usually taken by German uh, cameramen illegally. The army of the Germans did not want these pictures taken. But in fact, they are witness to the horrors that Armenians suffered 106 years ago. Here's a cartoon, a present day cartoon from the International New York Times that illustrates the, the uh, official Turkish explanation uh, as they rounded up the Armenians and set them off to their doom. And the Turkish officer is saying, don't worry, the word genocide doesn't exist yet. Indeed, the word genocide or murder of a people was only invented in during World War II by a Polish Jewish uh, jurist, Raphael Lemkin, who in fact created the word to describe the crimes, first of what had happened to the Armenians, and then what was going on at that time among the Jews. What this Armenian genocide did was create a people of victims, namely the Armenians. People who indeed somehow did survive these events to create new communities in Russia, in what would become Soviet Armenia, and then the independent Republic of Armenia, in France, in America, in Lebanon, in Syria, and other places throughout the world. They shall not perish. Maybe many of you older folks can remember when you were a child, I certainly remember, when people talked about the starving Armenians. I was told by, by that some of my friends were told, eat your food because the Armenians are starving. And that came out of this World War I experience. The other image that comes out of, the, of this experience is that of the terrible Turk. So you have Armenians as victims, Turks as perpetrators. And sometimes, as I mentioned before, that's enough of an explanation. One great power, here's the Turkish uh, figure, a egged on in the corner there by the Germans, victimizing the Armenians. Here's a famous Armenian victim, one whose uh, story would be made into a film in America, the auction of souls or ravished Armenia, the Frank story of Aurora Mardiganyan, who survived while four, four millions perished. In other words, after World War I, there was no denial of the Armenian genocide. In America, in the West, even in Turkey for a short time, this genocide, uh, without that word yet being invented, was recognized. The memory of the genocide goes on because of people like this Armin Wegner, the German officer who took the pictures, the forbidden pictures that we have today. And indeed, some of the great uh, testaments of what occurred by the German uh, pastor Johannes Lepsius, who wrote about these events, and by James Bryce, uh, uh, the Viscount Gray, uh, who in fact compiled or had his people compile the records of the genocide. As a result of the genocide, the Ottoman Empire did not survive, it fell. And in its place, the current Republic of Turkey now exists. Those events, in fact, can be explained, I think, by what I call an affective disposition, a certain kind of emotional, cognitive formation, 
in the minds of the Turkish leaders and of much of the population that led them to believe erroneously, pathologically, that their Armenian subjects had become an existential threat to their lives, their destiny, their country. Once that was created, once an image and an understanding of Armenians had been created in which they were a threat, then people could justify this mass murder, this devastating treatment of some of their neighbors uh, and friends. So in my book uh, that I've written, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, A History of the Armenian Genocide, which is available in hardback and paperback from Princeton University Press, from Amazon, and even in an audio version, you can find out more about how this affective disposition, this mental set of ideas and feelings was created that led to mass murder. Why is that important? Because we see even today in our own country in the United States and in many other parts of the world that the rhetoric, the ideas spread by leaders can create these kind of vicious, hostile, exclusionary, almost racist remarks and ways of characterizing other people. It might be as often in world history directed against the Jews. When you can't find someone to blame, you can always blame the Jews. And that's been done in Christian Europe for centuries. Sometimes later, you blame the Arabs. Oh, they're all terrorists, those Palestinians. And images develop in which all kinds of atrocities like the Israeli occupation can be directed against the Palestinians. Armenians too have been victims at times. Uh, and indeed in Turkey today, the small community that exists, only about 50 or 60,000, are still set upon and put upon and discriminated against by the Turkish government, which uses them often as an excuse for their own repressive policies uh, and more authoritarian rule. So this is the story that I wanted to tell you about how a population of relatively loyal, most Armenians were not revolutionaries, and the revolutionaries were thought they were defending the helpless Armenians, how this population was demonized, was made into uh, a existential threat, and eventually that would justify uh, their mass deportation and massacre. We can today do much better than that. And that's why I guess it's worth turning your uh, attention to April 24th and thinking about the memories of those who have been victimized, how ultimately they survived, and why if we pay attention, learn about these hard, dark spots in our past, we can indeed in the future look to greater harmony, coexistence, and a brighter, brighter life for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and watching the chat, if anybody has any questions or comments, you can type them there. Or if you'd like to indicate, we'll unmute you and you could say what you'd like to say. So let's see what you have to say. You're all very quiet right now. Um, Dr. Suni, uh, Margaret, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I can. Okay. My mother was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. And she told, the sad part was, they never spoke about it. It was very difficult for them to put into words what they had went through. But she did tell us that she did ride on horseback and on mules from, she was born in uh, Malatia, and she went on horseback to Beirut, where there was a huge Armenian community. And she told about the children being thrown into the river, but she wouldn't tell us a whole, but she lost her entire family, went to the Red Cross to try to get them to find them, but it was 
they couldn't do it. This was, you know, right after she came here, which was in like 1928, 1930 or so. I think though, the Detroit metropolitan area, uh, do we not have the second largest Armenian population? I mean, don't count California, but I mean, are we not about the second largest with about, what, 40,000 here? I'm not sure if we're second, third, but there is a very lively and coherent Armenian community in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful churches, an Armenian museum, um, a great leadership, so uh, uh, schools. So we're very fortunate in this area. It's not the largest, perhaps. It's not as, as variegated as in California. But uh, Detroit, I was very impressed when I first came to teach at the University of Michigan, how active, how organized, how conscious they were of these events. Now, Margaret, you tell a story that's really interesting because very often after traumatic events like the genocide or the Holocaust, uh, the next, the, those who have gone through that event find it difficult to express openly. Mm -hmm. Many do eventually, but the stories of the next generation who wanted to find out what had happened but we're not able to query their, their parents or grandparents is very familiar. Um, one of the good things is that we did have a lot of oral uh, history projects. Some of them are housed uh, on the Dearborn, Mich University of Michigan Dearborn campus, and those records do exist. So we have an enormous record. Uh, when I was doing the research for They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, I thought I cannot read all the documentation that now exists in a lifetime in order to tell this story. Um, and so the idea that someone could deny that it happened uh, is extraordinary to me. It's just vicious, uh, it's a lie, and it has to be fought against. Well, did not um, the ambassador, oh, it was a Jewish ambassador to Turkey speak out against the genocide? For the life of me, I can't think of his name right now, but they told him that, that if he spoke out, it would ruin his political career. And I can't, do you remember his name? He was a- Of course, of course. I write about him in the book. Uh, our, our ambassador, the American ambassador to Turkey at the time was uh, Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau, yes, and yes. He, he wrote, he was appointed by Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. the, the ambassadorship in Istanbul was considered a kind of Jewish position, right? And uh, Morgenthau was reluctant at first to go, but he went, and then he happened to overlap with the actual events of the genocide. And he wrote a brilliant book uh, called Ambassador Morgenthau's Diary that in some ways became a template for many of the successive versions that people tell that story. Morgenthau himself was actually a friend and went riding in the Belgrade uh, forest with Talat Pasha. And so there are stories in that book of conversations with Talat, in which, which Talat says to Morgenthau why they car are carrying out these massive killings. The Armenians have revolted against us. The Armenians have dominated us. In other words, uh, feelings of resentment and anger, all of those things are expressed quite well uh, in Talat's conversations with Morgenthau. I urge you to read that book as well. Yeah. Fine first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the other comment, my granddaughter had one of your lectures. She went to U of M and she's, uh, you know, tall, hazel hair, hazel eyes, uh, kind of light brown hair. And when she was there, no one said to her, you know, you don't look Armenian. The assumption was, if I am there, I am Armenian. And it was kind of like neat how all the kids would get together for these Armenian clubs. And just the fact that they had a grandmother or some, you know, some relative that kind of brought them all together. You know, I think it's a William Soroyan thing. Two Armenians get together and we form a nation, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah, you were very delightful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi. May I? Uh say something <laughs> well um i'm turkish and i grown up in turkey with i had uh, many armenian friends over there 
and we are really in good relationship. We didn't have problem during the school time or after social time. I have still many. Uh, anyway, I. Uh, Can you go on? Go ahead. Go ahead. All Armenians are killed in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. I, I don't think all Armenians killed. Um, I mean, since there are many living in Turkey. So that's one thing. I mean, probably you didn't mean that, but you didn't point out that. So the way you describe is like all Armenians were killed. I know, I didn't, also, didn't say that at all. I, I didn't. You didn't. You didn't mention how many uh, Muslims killed by ARF, Armenian Revolutionary Federation. So, may, actually, many innocent Armenians at that time demonized by or because of uh, ARF. Also, um, the um, after afterwards, I mean you. After 1916, uh, or after the revolutionary revolution in Turkey, uh, those officials like Talat Pasha, Jamal Pasha, they escaped uh, abroad and they were killed by uh, ARF from 1918 to 28. Also in 1920s, there were massacre trials that punished many officials who had uh, responsibility for the killings of those uh, Armenians during exile. So, I, and then in 1970s, 79 to 89, 75 to 85, uh, another terrorist organization, Asala, killed many Turkish diplomats and uh, civil people. Like total 49 people died, more than 256 people injured. So over the hundred, I mean, I'm really sorry what happened during those war times. I mean, I think both people, I mean, all people died because of nothing during, during those war times. I'm really sorry. But after hundreds of years, what is, I mean, what should be paid? How many people should die more? Oh, or in, in, I have friends living in California, I'm in Michigan, but I have many Turkish friends. They are daily based facing hate uh, talks, hate uh, insults. I, how, how long that should go? A very good question. Speaking of all these things, is creating discrimination, increasing hate. I'm really worried about for, for young generations, not myself. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. That's why I wrote this book. That is, I am fighting against stereotypes, stereotypes of Armenians as traitors and as rebels. I'm fighting against the idea of the terrible Turk. I'm trying to explain why a government would turn on part of its population and carry out these terrible events. I take it, uh, uh, Ms. Essen, that you're not arguing that the genocide didn't occur. You recognize that it occurred. You're worried more about the effects and how hatred continues, which is a very good point to make. So my argument is, uh, and, and if one wants peace between peoples, uh, then you need to recognize what occurred. You need to be honest about what occurred. You need to understand why it occurred. I'm a historian. I'm a professional historian. Uh, I look at facts. I look at archives. I read uh, memoirs. I read documents. And then I make the most plausible case I can. Uh, and it's, it's almost impossible now uh, to deny effectively, honestly, that these events occurred. One of the things we did, uh, and I'm so proud of this, I have a colleague here at Michigan, Turkish woman, Amuge Gerçek. Uh, she and I formed a group called Workshop in Armenian Turkish Scholarship. 
And for two decades, we organized conferences, 11 different workshops all over the world. Indeed, in 2015, we held it in Istanbul. Uh, and we would bring Turks, Kurds, Armenians, uh, Germans, uh, English, Russians, whoever we could get together to discuss these events. Scholars, historians discussing what happened. And the most interesting thing was younger generations of young Turkish scholars trained in Turkey and often trained in Europe or in America who know the Ottoman language, Osmanlı, Osmanlı, Osmanlı they would know these languages uh, and they could read the original documents. So we now have incredibly a generation of Turkish scholars, Kurdish scholars, who can tell us the story from inside, from reading the documents in, in, in the archives. That's an enormous development. Now, officially, the Erdogan government still denies the genocide. Uh, there have been some gestures at apology, but uh, uh, nothing really significant. And by the way, the US government also has not yet recognized officially the genocide because it wants to maintain its relationship with Turkey and the Israeli government also hasn't recognized the genocide because it has a very tender and difficult relationship with Turkey. So I applaud the idea uh, that we should begin these dialogues and continue. My view is as a historian, as an educator, is that reconciliation and understanding comes from knowledge, from research, reading, writing, and understanding what actually happened. Not from denial, not from apologies, not from blaming, you know, 70 years later, terrorists or whatever, who were so incensed by these events that they carried out terrible acts, which I, by the way, was opposed to. However, some historians are not calling it genocide. I mean, because they say it's a, a court decision. Uh, also, uh, like they need to decide based on looking for all archives. Were you able to uh, <laughs> study uh, Armenian archives? Sorry? I've, were you able to study Armenian archives? Oh, yeah, we study all the archives. I mean, the, the most interesting archive, if you're really interested in, and by the way, it's largely published, was the, is the German archive. Because the Germans were allies of the Turks at the time. And they were reporting from the field, from Aleppo, from Erzurum and elsewhere about what was going on. Uh, and those reports went to Berlin and, and people said to the Kaiser, to the emperor of the Germans, we must do something about this. This is making us look bad. Our allies are carrying out these mass killings. And the Kaiser said, no, no, we need the Ottomans right now. Let's keep it quiet. And they didn't do anything about it. So Germany was also complicit in these events. But look, take a look at them. They are available. You'll be amazed by them. All right, we do have a few questions from the chat. Um, first, Joan wonders if your book is available in Turkey. She knows you've attended educational conferences there in the past. My book is available in Turkish. Yes, not in Armenian, but in Turkish. Uh, um, it's Anjak uh, Cholde uh, Yashoyabililer. It exists. They can only exist in the desert. Uh, yeah, so Bir Sorkirimin Tari. It's called A History of a Genocide. Uh, it was translated by an Armenian press in Istanbul and it is available. I have more books in Turkish than any other language <laughs> except English. <laughs> um. And then you hinted at the answer for this, but do you think the US will ever push harder for Turkey to acknowledge the genocide? What are we afraid of? I think it may happen. It may happen under Biden uh, because Biden doesn't particularly like Erdogan. There have been some incidents and he's actually pledged so far that he would do something about it. Now, every other presidential candidate has also made the same promise, including Barack Obama, and then did nothing about it. Obama just called it, uh, you know, a great tragedy, uh, you know, Metz Yeren, he used the Armenian term, but not, but, um, and you know, um, Ms. Essen's point is a very good one. Genocide is not only a kind of description of a certain kind of event, 
the mass killing of a cultural, religious, or ethnic group, which fits this particular event or the Holocaust, but also is a technical international law term. And if a government recognizes something as a genocide, it's obligated then to do something about it. And therefore governments are reluctant actually to do that. So it's a complicated event, but mainly it's about uh, uh, international st strategic calculations. Turkey is a valued ally. Uh, it, it's on the border of the Caucasus uh, in the Middle East, but its credibility among American foreign policy figures has declined in recent years uh, as the Trump administration agreed to let the Turkish Republican forces to go into Syria and to carry out terrible atrocities against the Kurds who had been our allies in the fight against ISIS. Sarah asks, is there still a substantial Armenian population in Russia and do they still experience discrimination? So um, the Armenia was a Soviet Republic. So it was part of the Soviet Union. That little Republic is now an independent state. It just suffered a big defeat in a war with Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan was aided by Turkey, um, but there are many Ar Armenians uh, in Russia itself. They're well-respected. There's not much discrimination against Armenians in Russia. They do pretty well there. All right, a couple attendees are talking about Sandcastle Girls. Have you read that book? Yes. Does it, does it ring true? I like that book very much. It's a bit romantic, but it's beautifully written. And it's largely about the period after the major massacres when Armenians were driven into the deserts of Syria. So the events take place in Aleppo and other parts of that. And it tells you a beautiful story. It's a very nice book. Is there an Armenian museum that addresses the genocide? There are several attempts at Armenian museums. Uh, there's, there's one in Washington, which is being opened. Uh, there's one in Boston, which often deals with the question. There's a lovely museum closer to home for all of us in Southfield, uh, the uh, Manukian Museum. It's largely an art museum uh, and Armenian artifacts, beautiful place. And there you can see some of the things of the culture that was lost in Anatolia uh, in historic Armenia after the genocide. And then as Essen is saying, recognizing the 1915 events as genocide does not affect Turkey because it needs an international court's decision. And the campaigns going on in the US is only working to increase the hate against Turks in the US today. Well, there's an easy way to avoid that. <laughs> There are no more questions, no more comments. Going once, going twice. All right, well, I much. just wanna thank you so much. This was very enlightening. As someone else pointed out in the chat, I never learned about this in my high school classes either. So it's not a topic that many people are knowledgeable about, but you've really enlightened us on it. And I wanna thank, thank you very much. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in tonight on this lovely evening. And uh, I hope you be safe and be well. So thanks a lot.